for this afternoon, we're having three. We're having three relevant journalists, which is going to be interesting enough. Let's get started by Mr. Folorou. Merci de... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Just uh, a few words on behalf of the director of the Le Monde newspaper. Who believes that it's the responsibility of journalists today to explain the work that they're doing on this subject. In France, this is still considered to be a rather minor subject, this uh, affront to individual and public freedoms. And I'm really here today, just as a journalist, to talk to you about the work that we were doing, what we were working on, and the series of articles that we wrote uh, at the beginning of July, which meant that we were able to relieve, uh, reveal sorry, the existence of a, a massive storage and interception system for personal data in France. And uh, this was not subject to any real administrative or political scrutiny. So this was an investigation that we carried out following the revelations made regarding the PRISM system. And in France, unlike in the United States or in the United Kingdom, all of the technological means that are available for intercepting electronic signals are not separately stored like they are, for example, in GHCQ or in, at the NSA, but these technological means, these resources are actually in the hands of the DGSE, which is the uh, French intelligence service, basically, uh, which is supposed to be working outside French borders. And they hold these technologies then. And since 2005 or 2006, or even 2007, over these three years, these, uh, this intelligence service was uh, granted a huge amount of technological resources. Uh, these were financed by the parliament in the framework of uh, an update which is what it was called, an update of the means that France has to intercept electronic signals um, when it comes to improving the sovereignty of uh, intelligence gathering that is done in France. I'll come back later on to the reasons why um, France created problems when it equipped itself with these technologies. Because for us, it's not really a question as to whether it's a good idea or not for a country to be combating terrorism. For us, really, the big issue is scrutiny. Because this database, which, unlike what we're told officially, is actually storing billions of data for a number of years, is not just a database which is exclusively used by the intelligence services, which again operates outside France. But it, in France, there is a system which is able to tap into this huge database, which is currently run by the largest computer server in France. Uh, so that means that other intelligence services in France are able, by law, to intervene and tap into uh, this database, and they are operating on French territory. And this is a daily check. These are daily checks, checks then, that are being carried out by these services um, that nobody knew about before. Because this means that... Today, the counter-espionage service, or indeed the customs authorities, or the track fin authorities, which are involved in investigating financial crimes, can get in touch with the intelligence services, the DGSE, and get information on any individual. These could be people who have been involved with terrorist actions or terrorists themselves. That's possible. But we're basically working on the principle that the, uh, the person requesting the information is acting within the law. But there is no other validation of the research done or the compiling of this data or the way in which it's stored. So you have a kind of parallel system here which is totally without proper scrutiny. And it really... Uh, is very much in the same vein of 
the revelations made by the by John Snowden regard Edward Snowden rather regarding the prism system basically an intelligence service has the means now to carry out massive interception and storage of personal data and there is no real scrutiny it's just up to the executive to intercept that data and then store the data now of course in France there is legislation in place, which originally focused on telephone interceptions, and there are even proper bodies which have to be consulted by the police, for example, or other services when they want to start uh, tapping people's telephone calls and so on. This is known as the CNCES in France, this body. But when it comes to metadata, and that's the data that are stored by the GSE, then actually the CN CIS doesn't have either the personnel or the administrative capacity or even the right um, to be in working in consultation uh, on that or to know what's happening to these metadata. Now, this all happened in July then. These revelations came out in July. And paradoxically, there wasn't really much of a reaction and that's why it's really important and meaningful for us to be able to speak here to you today because basically in a country like France where there is a very strong centralized state we've got the fifth republic now but generally people seem to think that it's not that strange for a state to have these technological means and to carry out uh, these activities People think it's normal. Now, we think that that is uh, a bit poor in terms of counter-establishment power or anti-establishment power. And uh, the discussions so far have really been technical discussions regarding the actual technological means that the GGSE have to actually intercept uh, signals. People have been focusing on that instead of looking at the law or looking at the extent of scrutiny held by the parliament for example or indeed uh, more basic things like uh, citizens freedoms and the rights that they should ha hold when it comes to protecting their private data or the data of companies or the state for example and that is really why that we as journalists non-political actors uh, want to react and here we are now talking to you at the European Parliament, you have set up this committee of inquiry to look into this. And if the Parliament takes this so seriously, then it's perhaps because... Well, that, the, 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 the sad thing is here that it's not necessarily the Parliament that is going to be able to take action to try to roll back uh, these infringements on people's rights and privacy. Because if you look at the reaction to these revelations or the reactions to uh, the PRISM revelations by the NSA when it comes to telephone surveillance or interceptions of uh, communications between governments or French ministers and so on, then you can see that uh, each country reacts in its own way. But obviously in America, uh, there's a lot more money behind uh, the different reactions. But in Europe, it has been rather meagre. But if France were sort of to step up to the plate and uh, start perhaps throwing, uh, you know, more s serious arguments against America, then you might have wa Washington responding in a more robust way. So this is what really what we were interested in, how this is all panning out, and obviously this is a work in progress. We were looking particularly at the French uh, compiling of data and the storage of these data, and also looking at the possibility of agreements that exist between different services for intelligence in France and the agreements that exist between them and the telephone operators like SFR, Bouygues, Orange, we don't know if these agreements exist as 
there were agreements found to be in existence between the NSA and other uh, major operators, agreements then regarding the capacity to intercept uh, all traffic. So there are lots of question marks still that we need to have answers for. There was a parliamentary delegation for uh, information which is responsible for trying to exercise scrutiny over the French intelligence services. This is a fairly new uh, body. They've only been in place, this group, since 2007, and they have restricted means available to them. For example, they're only allowed to speak to the directors of the French intelligence services. And uh, their communication powers are really very limited. And the members of the delegation uh, are important people. The chairman of the Defence Committee, for example, the chairman of the uh, Justice Committee. So they're very busy people anyway, so they haven't got much time to dedicate to this particular scrutiny committee or delegation. Uh, just a few more words before we get to the Q&A, which will be more interesting. As a journalist, what I'm really struck by here is the way in which the different political stakeholders in France have reacted. The French members of parliament are basically accepting, really, the idea that the government should have these powers. They are somehow giving their sort of approval or acceptance to this infringement of their powers, this encroachment. And as journalists, that's really what's shocked us. We see this reaction again and again. Lots of people just say, you know, it's not that serious, it's not that important. But when we speak to government representatives, people who, for example, work closely with the French president or the French prime minister, or even people who are high-ranking uh, officials in the intelligence services, these people who perhaps accept the debate per se, uh, you know, they will say again and again, you're worrying about nothing. Because at the end of the day, people who are responsible for massive interception of data, at the end of the day, these people are defenders of our republic. And uh, maybe it's true. People working for the intelligence services, you know, most of them really are interested in democracy. But, and the point is that people who are responsible for these different competences are true Republicans. They're French Republicans. They will not uh, betray their country. And these amazing uh, technologies, you know, are safe within the hands of these people. That's what we're told again and again. But these are questions of principle, really. That's why the law is so important. Because... If we were just to sort of uh, say, okay, you know, this is all okay, and if we assume that these technologies are not used for anything other than terrorism and combating terrorism and other threats and so on, but the point is, these technologies could all at any moment be used for other purposes, uh, encroaching on people's private lives and so on. We don't know what they're going to be used for, and we saw as well that under uh, Sarkozy, it, you know, there were incidences where the law could be bypassed to protect people's individuals in, uh, individual interests. And the problem is then that people are acting outside the law. And as journalists, we also have an interest in the idea of uh, citizenship and uh, calling the establishment to account. It doesn't mean we're sort of being militant about it, but we just have a, a, a role to play. We don't want to sort of try and play a kind of messiah role or anything like that, but we've got to keep people on their toes and be vigilant. That's our role. That's how we see our role. So we hope that the work being done here in Brussels at the European Parliament will uh, alert people to what's going on. Um, I'm a little bit pessimistic as to what will happen in French, in France, though. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Follow.